everybody, I'm Sarah and I'm a God of Life. Welcome to my introduction to Fun Egg de Flauten Lusthof. What is that? I hear you cry. It is a huge collection of music written for the solo recorder. It's one of the staples of our repertoire and I talk about it all the time. So I thought it was about time I gave you a proper introduction to this huge work. Jakob van Eyck was a Dutch composer active in the beginning of the 17th century. He was actually employed as a bell and carillion maker, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and he was very talented at this, but on the side he was also a recorder player. Um, he was actually completely blind and he would improvise a lot of the music that he made. He lived in Utrecht and I believe he was employed by the council there to sit on the Jans Gerkhof, that is a square that you can still visit today, and play his recorder to scare away the groups of teenagers that were hanging around. I heard this story somewhere and I really hope it's true. So what Van Eyck would do, he would take all of the kind of popular tunes of the day, folk songs, religious songs, pop songs of the early 17th century, and he would improvise upon them. He was just a genius at this. He could take a simple song and make the most beautiful, intricate variations. And at some point, um, I don't know, someone sat down with him and notated all of these. The result is De Flauten Lusthof, or The Flute's Pleasure Garden, um, a huge collection in multiple volumes of over 140 pieces. And we can be very proud of this fact. This is actually the largest collection of uh, Western classical music written for any solo instrument. That includes you, piano, violin, whatever. The biggest collection is for the recorder. That is something that I'm sure you can impress all of your friends with. And not only is this beautiful music, it's really fascinating as a historical document because it's basically like the top 40 charts of the early 17th century. We've got popular songs from all over Europe and it's really just interesting to see what was played then. Something very important. Today I am giving you a general introduction into these pieces. It is not a definitive guide for how it has to be played. Everything I say can also be, yeah, taken in a different way. Um, the question of how to play these pieces historically accurate is a very big one. Um, it's not something I'm really going to go into today, but I am going to give you resources later on in the video for if you want to get into that yourself. Okay? it work? Okay, every piece always begins in its kind of pure form, the normal tune. I'm going to demonstrate this with um, one that I really like, it's called Stemma Nofa. Then Van Eyck would take this theme and create subsequent variations of it that were increasing in complexity. So the first variation of Stem Nova is... And this practice of taking a melody and breaking it down into smaller note values is called writing diminutions or divisions. In variation two, we get some bigger jumps because he's illustrating the harmony. But you can still clearly hear the original tune throughout. Then in variation three, we go even faster, a bit more virtuosic. this. The first question is what recorder should you be playing this music on? Now how it's notated it pretty much all fits the soprano or tenor recorder thus I always play it with soprano fingering but it is completely solo music. Personally I think it's fine to experiment and take different sizes of recorder that can uh, give a really different character or sound to the piece that you're playing. 
This G alto was made by Stefan Bletzinger and it's called a transitional instrument, kind of transitioning between the Renaissance and the Baroque times. And it's designed for this period. And I think it sounds really beautiful on this recorder. But if you just, got, if you just have a normal one, then that's also absolutely fine. Don't worry. Then, then comes the big task of picking which piece you're going to play. There are a lot of them. Um, number 83 in volume 2, Steminofa, I think is a nice one to begin with because it's quite simple. I would also say don't be afraid to play the famous ones. I used to avoid those just because everyone else was doing them. But you know, they are there for a reason. We have the ones like Daphne. <laughs> the Pavan Lacrimé. Um, the English Nightingale. Uh, Buffons. have a favourite fun Ike please please share it below. The first and I would say most important step is really get to know the theme. If possible learn it by heart so that you can just sing it whatever you're doing because this is the foundation for all of those virtuosic variations. And you want to keep this theme in mind and be able to hear it no matter what fast variation you're playing. I will move on to the next variation and play that slowly, trying to identify which notes appear in the theme. Now, Fanag uses a lot of different techniques. One is filling up the gaps between the melody with scales. For example, becomes and then becomes. And I always try and make these scalic passages as smooth and flowing as possible. He also uses scales in thirds that are arranged in different ways. So for example, we have becomes if you play this like a robot like then it loses its shape it's kind of light and shade so I would use articulation to bring it out in different ways The articulation is a good question. What is right and wrong? Again, I'm not going to give you any concrete answers, but um, I think it's important to create shape to the music and to create variation. It's not only one kind of flat line. For fast passages, I like to use diddle. Diddle, 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 diddle. But that might be just because it's the most comfortable for me. If you can do a smooth dugga, 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 also fine. And then my favourite variations are actually the ones with the big jumps because then we're hitting different notes of the chord and we're making harmonies. That's using an arpeggio to illustrate a chord. It's also creating different voices, so I would kind of make a difference between these high and these low notes to try and make it sound as if you are two instruments talking to one another. You could practice this by bringing out the upper voice, and then the lower, and then making a combination that you enjoy. 
And then for the fastest passages, the ones with the 16th notes or even the 32nd notes, um, my most obvious tip is going to be start off practicing these slowly taking into account all the different things that Van Eyck has shoved in there. The scales, the jumps, the leaps. We're gonna have some octaves. One of the most important things is to keep the character of the piece throughout, even in these fast variations with 16th or even 32nd notes. It will be quite jarring to have a very beautiful plaintive opening theme and then we get to the last bit and it's all just about and on the whole these pieces should sound like they're improvised you know no pressure Van Eyck literally improvised these into being so try and make them sound as spontaneous as possible you could pull around a little bit with the tempo or the articulation or you know just have a bit of fun with them but ah that is a good question tempo. One of the most controversial arguments surrounding these pieces of Van Eyck is how fixed are the tempos? Can you swap them between variations? This is something that gets discussed a lot I know in the recorder Facebook groups. I always really enjoy reading them and um, the answer is um, I'll be honest, I don't know the exact answer. Let's look at your reasons for wanting to change tempo between the movements. If it's technical, you simply can't play that last movement that fast, then I think it's a bit of a shame to make it slower just for that reason. I could imagine, say you have a piece with a lot of different variations, for example, Lanterlou, um, that you would say, okay, I want to do this one in a different tempo just to give a different character and to break it up a bit. Um, I don't personally know how historically accurate that would be, but if you can make it musically convincing, then I say, why not try? But the most important thing is that it all hangs together as one piece. I think they will probably have stayed in the same tempo as one another, but remember this was improvised, it wouldn't have been like a metronome. Now this is a really interesting question and a debate that I don't have the definitive answer to. If you really want to get into this uh, historically accurate side of playing, there are some great resources! In fact, two incredibly in-depth uh, books out on the market, all about the works of Van Eyck. The first is uh, Jakob Van Eyck's The Flaut and Lusthof by Ruth von Bach, and the second is Jakob Van Eyck and Others by Timo Wint. Both of these uh, scholars have created these amazing works, so if you really want to get deep into these pieces, I can really recommend them. These books are pretty expensive, um, quite rightly so, because they are full of information, but maybe you could uh, see if they're available in your local library. One important question with Van Eyck music is which edition do you buy? Now I have the Dolce edition and the Amadeus edition, however I have heard from good sources that both of these editions are still quite full of mistakes. You can also download the original facsimiles for free on IMSLP, but these are also quite full of mistakes. How can an original be full of mistakes? I hear you cry. Well, this guy was improvising and there was someone next to him trying to write everything down. So I'm not surprised that there were some inconsistencies. So as far as I know right now, the most accurate edition out there is the one published by XYZ and edited by Timo Vint. And there are so many recordings of these pieces out there, but the two I can really recommend are the ones by Dan Lauren. Dan actually recorded the Flaut and Lusthof complete. My God, that must have been a lot to practice. But he also released an album, I think called Evergreens, which is his selections. And the other important recording is of course, the one by Dutch recorder player, Eric Bosgraaf. Ah, that was my introduction into the Flaut and Lusthof by Jakob van Eyck, the biggest collection of solo recorder or any instrument music out there, and an amazing treasure trove of repertoire for you to get your recordery teeth into. Stay tuned next week because there's some big news coming up! Ah!
Well, that was it. As always, you can subscribe to my channel by clicking on my face down here. If you'd like to support Team Recorder, you can do that by heading over to my Patreon page. And up here, I'm going to link to a video on how to write your own diminutions should you decide that you are the incarnation of Jakob van Eyck. Have a great day. Bye.